We're very lucky tonight. We have um, a national figure to speak to us. His name is Jonathan Bowden, and he is the party's cultural officer. And he's well known all over the country for being pretty much the best speaker of the, that we've got. So I'd like to introduce him now to you, and I'm sure he'll join me in giving him a very warm welcome. <laughs> Well, thanks very much. Uh, maybe after that introduction I should just sit down again and leave it at that, you know. Um, could I ask people to turn their mobile phones off, please? I'm turning uh, mine off now. So let's just see the noise it makes when it goes off. But what I usually do is um, I pick out a few things that are in the news at the present time, and I highlight them, and then I sort of make a speech as I go along, because I never know what I'm going to say before I stand up, so it keeps uh, the thing fresh and slightly near the edge, you see. Now, there's various things that have been going on at the present time. Just over the last weekend, let's pick two out which appear to be disconnected. One is Cameron's revelations about his own early life, um, which is interesting, actually, because let's look back a couple of decades. Would a leader like Eden or Macmillan or Douglas Hume have appeared even metaphorically in the media with a spliff out of the corner of their mouth? Well, the answer is no, because the Tory party and other British institutions were a bit different in the 1950s and thereafter than today. And although people say what Cameron did when he was at school um, at Eton, a rather select sort of a school, doesn't matter and is of no importance and we shouldn't hold it against him, well this is all very problematical. This is a man who uses his private life for electoral advantage. He invites the media in to talk to the wife, to talk to the children. He puts in how he washes up with dolphin friendly washing up liquid on YouTube. He wants to be liked he says he's a nice man, but of course he's got a private life when something negative turns up. Another thing that's interesting about drug usage is that in order to use these sorts of substances, you've got to be pretty wet and pretty weak and pretty soft-minded. And there's a degree to which you can see it in Cameron's demeanour. There is a limpness and a fluidity and an inability to stick to any one thing and an absence of decisiveness. At the last election, he wrote the Tories manifesto with a few other people at central office, but he composed that manifesto. And that manifesto led on certain populist things, particularly immigration. If you remember, all over the country there were very big billboards paid by some of the Tories' relatively unknown financial backers saying, Immigration, colon, we know what you're thinking. Well, do they know? what ordinary English and British people are thinking about this. They do deep focus polling. They have various little groups that sit round in coffee mornings and discuss these things. And what are they discussing? They're discussing the fact that the country is now 14% non-white. 14%. That means it's 86% indigenous and 14% not. And much of this occurred under Tory administrations, particularly heats between 70 and 74 when large numbers of Asians were let in from Africa and elsewhere. Thatcher also let in a lot of primary immigration, particularly in and around the issue of Hong Kong, when she said in 79 that she had no intention of doing so. Well, why does this matter? It matters because when you go beyond a small town like this, when you go into London, where I was earlier today, we are becoming a minority in large areas of these cities in extreme West London, in Brent, we're a statistical minority already. In um, the east of the city, in somewhere like Newham, we're in a minority quite decisively. In parts of South London, we're in a minority. In inner Birmingham, we're in a minority. In the whole city of Leicester, a major city, we're in statistically the minority, when you add up all the other groups. Now, the BBC did a programme about Leicester when we became statistically a minority, and they said, does it matter? Is Leicester any less English and less, any less British? Well, it is. Because once a group gives up its finite and demographic character and becomes a minority in its own urban spaces, the writing is on the wall for it. We can hide behind political correctness. We can say, don't come for us. We can say, don't say anything that's anti-white or negative or non-Caucasian or un-British or un-English. We'll play these minority games when we become one. But when you've been the majority group in a society, when it's been yours forever, when you lose that, you'll suddenly feel a very cold and bracing wind on the back of your neck. 
It's not much fun being a minor- in a minority, particularly when you were once in a majority position. And these things are going to happen in about 60 years. Maybe 100. Maybe 110. Maybe 45 to 50. There are many people who are alive now who said, well, I'll be dead then. No, I'm not bothered. And there's many of our people who are leaving. Three million have left in the last couple of years. And many of them are not coming back. And they've gone to Canada, they've gone to the US, they've gone to Spain. Even the Spanish don't like the sort of anglophone influx that's occurring because after all it's their country. But the truth of the matter is that you can't really escape from what's happening. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is some of the reasons for why it's been happening. In the mass media, anyone from Enoch Powell on who says that this is a bad idea is demonised and regarded as a reactionary or a bigot or unprogressive or against the grain of the future. When in actual fact, these are patriotic and national positions without prejudice which have been entertained by people in these islands for centuries. But our present political establishment has lost its nerve and it's lost its will and it's become increasingly beholden to international forces. Large numbers of immigrants are here of all colours and kinds but particularly from the third world to do residual and low-grade capitalist jobs in a service sector economy fuelled by debt. Our citizens owe over a trillion pounds worth of debt. That's a billion, billion pounds worth of debt. That's about eight and a half to ten thousand pounds personally for every man, every woman, every adolescent, every child, and every child that's not aborted in the womb. And we carry this debt, and we keep on spending in order to keep our economy going. Because we service the services by which we're employed and through which we live all the time. You may have noticed that in the last 30 years we've ceased to make anything. We've ceased to make cars, we've ceased to make coal, we've ceased to build anything. Our entire economy consists of going to the cinema and having nice meals in restaurants and buying new cars and replacing everything we've got every three years and taking out more credit and paying more people to provide more bureaucratic input to taking out more credit. And we suck in labour just as we suck in capital or money from all over the world to keep this rather overheated economy, which is largely UK-wide, based in the southeast of England. There are immense economic dislocations. As part of speaking on behalf of this party internally, I've gone all around the country. I've been into Wales, I've been up to the northwest of England, down into the west country, into Birmingham. I was in Handsworth recently, in the middle of Birmingham. Hansworth is 99.7% non-white. There are no whites left in Hansworth. They've left. They vacated these inner Birmingham areas. This Christmas isn't celebrated in Hansworth. It's called Winterville. And all of the uh, ceremonies for the Hindu religion, for the Sikh religion, for the Muslim religion, even the African New Year is celebrated. But Christmas is not. That's because we've vacated the area. We've left it. And there are people in the Midlands, people who've moved to one side of these areas, both inside the Birmingham Conurbation and beyond it, who call these areas the Occupied Territories. That's what they call them. No politician in the Midlands, in Birmingham City Council, a very powerful institution that spends a lot of taxpayers' money, and not just local money either, would ever make a remark like that. It would cost them their career. But the fact is, it's the truth. And for the last 30 to 40 years, large numbers of our people have been asleep and have not wanted to know and have felt that they can move. They can move from an inner part of a town to a suburb. They can move from the inner part of a suburb to the exterior end of a suburb. They can move from a suburb into a village or a small sort of uh, urban village, tiny little sort of hamlet place. They can move from that to a smaller row of cottages somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But in the end... Parts of our people get trapped in the spokes of that sort of particular comb. They can't move any further. They can't get a mortgage which is three to five times salary or with a couple five times a joint salary and so on. There comes a moment when you can't move anymore to avoid the demographic and racial changes which have gone on. Millions of people have left London, where I was earlier today, to get away from what's happening. The Evening Standard, the local rag in that city, 
worries and sort of uh, wrings its hands about why all these Londoners are leaving our capital city. Not just England's capital city, but Britain's capital city. Once an imperial capital. Why are they leaving? They're leaving because they no longer feel at home there. Why do they no longer feel at home there? Because in many areas of the city, they're in a minority. They feel like a stranger in their own urban space. Why is that? Because large numbers of people from Africa, from Asia, from Eurasia, from the Pacific Rim, from North and South America, from the Caribbean, from the Indian subcontinent, and from elsewhere, the Middle East, and elsewhere, are living there. Why are they here? Because they're servicing the service sector economy that we've got. Why is that? Because the entire economy relies on overheated services and immigrants keep wages down at the bottom of the economy, which is why they're here. Now, liberal-minded people say that he may be factually right, but he's emotionally and ideologically wrong, because this isn't a problem, and it can always be dealt with, and our politicians mean well, and we must be humane, and there are no real problems, except a few extremists who exaggerate things. And extremism takes various forms. I began this little talk by talking about the Tory leader, David Cameron, a week ago, or two weeks ago, Cameron compared this party and the people who support it, attend its meetings, and possibly vote for it, to, as the moral equivalent of Islamic terrorism. He said, these people are the white equivalent, the British equivalent, without violence, he did concede that, um, of vanguard Muslims who want to blow up buses and blow up tube stations and blow up underground uh, rail networks as they did a couple of years ago in London. Now why are they doing that? They're doing that because they're the tiny vanguard tip of an Islamist pyramid that exists in all Muslim communities in the West and throughout the world. And they're at war with this civilization. We hear much in the media about the moderate Muslims that want nothing to have that want nothing to do with this extremism alleged. Now, there are moderate Muslims, and there are Muslims who don't really believe in their religion, but go along with it in public. And there are all sorts of gradations in all sorts of groups. But the Islamic civilization is clashing very severely with ours, because there's a fundamental disagreement about values. They don't agree with the nature of this society, even though there are millions of them now living here, between one and a half and three million, depending on whose statistics you agree, you believe. Immigration is itself a movable feast. Legally, by million, six million, illegally, 750,000 through 1.4 million, 17 million people pass through the country and go away year on year. Our borders are porous, 200 million people enter our airspace every year and go out again. Increasingly we have no control over our borders at all. But one returns to the question of Islam. Now I have a lot of respect for Muslims actually, because they agree with spiritual values that they posit as absolute. They control one whole crescent of the earth. If you look at many of their flags, there's a crescent on it. And this signifies where they are on the globe, from Morocco at one end to Indonesia at the end, at the other end. Now, their indictment of us is that we're materialist and that we're lazy and that we don't care about ultimate values. And there's an element of truth to it because we've got very soft in the West We've got very lax everywhere. We're weak on crime. We don't control our own borders. We don't seem to have solidarity too much amongst ourselves. Patriotism is dimming. Our future Prime Minister allegedly admits he sort of used drugs when he was a kid and so what. Homosexual civil marriage has just been legalised. We have mass abortion. Do large numbers of our people really agree with these things? Because they have voted for parties that have put these things into place. They have voted for the Liberal Party. They have voted for the Labour Party, new and old. They have voted for the Conservative Party. And although there are people of goodwill and patriotic intent in all of these groups, the truth of the matter is that every generation that's passed, this society becomes more broken down, more fluid, more spiritually empty, more filled up with foreigners, more decadent, and moves further and further away from the wishes and desires of ordinary English and British people. Whilst there's a quacking propaganda 
from the box in the corner, the television and elsewhere, that everything's getting better and better and better. One issue that the British people have never been consulted about is membership of the European Union. Increasingly, our politicians at Westminster and devolved politicians in Cardiff and Edinburgh in relation to uh, Wales and Scotland don't control the future destiny of our society. The better part of 60% of all our laws are decided in Brussels. And you only have to focus on one particular media issue and you see the whole vista revealed before you. Look what's going on with Bernard Matthews and his um, contaminated turkeys. We've been told various, we are the turkeys, aren't we really? We've been told various things about what's been going on there for the last week or so. But the real point at issue that cuts through all the flab and the lies and the propaganda is that our own government couldn't apply restrictions on the movement of tainted meat because it's contrary to EU regulations and because there would be counter-sanctions against us by European countries. So even in relation to disease that pertains to our own foodstuffs, we do not any longer have the real sovereign power to impose our will on an area in the eastern part of our own country. That is the truth, and that is something that the media forbears from telling us all, as Bernard Matthews doesn't appear before the cameras, as he used to do 25 years ago, saying it's all beautiful. And it's not at the moment, in every respect. Because the interesting thing I think about the media is if you go through the local media, the national media, the regional media, the CNN, the satellite media, and you stop, and you freeze the frame, freeze the page on any issue, all of the major issues that confront us are actually interconnected. Every paper and every journal, or its internet equivalent that's worth anything, you look at it, the first page is crime. Mugging, rape, murder, gun crime, gangsterism, drug usage, drug cartels. Then there's ideological crime, terrorism, bombing, Islamist extremism, attacks on us from within and without. Then we have EU-related matters, which are basically because we can't decide our own laws in our own place through our own political elite, because the power has slipped outside the country and gone elsewhere. Then we have issues of paedophilia. It's in the media all the time, or on a semi, in a semi-permanent way, in page four, page five. 30, 40 years ago, although these crimes went on, they weren't mentioned to the same degree. Then one has a sort of general looseness and chaos and fluidity. Have you noticed that many people who are over 50, certainly over 60, will not go into the centre of our towns and cities after about 6 in the evening, particularly on a Thursday, most especially on a Friday, and in particular on a Saturday evening? Why not? They built this country. They're facing, uh, their future generations are facing a future without a pension, and our present pensioners cannot go into the centre, many of them, of towns and cities because they're actually marginally afraid. And you do sense with many of our people that there is a fear. There's a fear of associating even with this party, which is radically disapproved of by the media, locally and nationally and internationally. Why is it disapproved of? Why is it mildly condemned to extremely hated? Why, when the man who founded this party died a couple of years ago, did the Daily Mirror, mass circulation, tabloid rag, say to its readers that he should rot in hell. What is it about this party that upsets many of the people who are in power? They're upset because it's the opposite and advocates the reversal of what exists now. What we advocate is a more crime-free Britain. A Britain with national state sovereignty renewed and returned from the European Union to us in these islands. A whiter society. A more organic society and community with illegal immigration removed and with the floodgates closed and the tax turned off for a period we advocate more reindustrialization. we advocate productivity at the point of production we advocate making, making things again in our own country we advocate not tolerating the presence in our midst of vanguards who wish to blow us up but understand that a part of the world is theirs and that we should have the symmetry of blocks where they return to build their concept of Islam in their own civilization, 
and they leave our part of the world to us. You have to understand that in a world that isn't liberal, as the present one is, more hardline people in all groups would be in power. But they can deal with each other because they speak the same language and they understand each other. Muslim civilization despises weakness and sees the current West as weak and therefore partly as prey. Paradoxically, many of them would respect this sort of party because they know where they are with it. When I mentioned liberalism a couple of moments ago, I'm not talking about the Liberal Democrat Party. I'm talking about the fact that when you turn your television on and you look at Cameron and you look at Blair and you look at Menus Campbell and you look at Kennedy who was the drunkard who was in power with the Liberals before Menus Campbell and you look at Tory leaders like Howard and Duncan Smith uh, before the present incumbent, they're all the same. And everyone knows they're all the same. Labour voters used to think that the Labour Party was for them, that it was against the Tories, that it would look after them. Tory voters in middle class areas always thought that the blue ticket, the blue rosette was for them. But increasingly all of our people in the two big classes look at the party representatives that they've chosen for generations and they see the same people mouthing the same platitudes and the same lies with slightly different terms of reference and slightly different coloured rosettes. But they're the same. On all of the big issues, they want to remain in Europe. They want to be beholden to the United States. They want to be inveigled endlessly into American globalist and expansionist wars across the earth. We've just lost our hundredth man in Iraq. Why are we in Iraq? That's a very complicated and disconnected series of reasons why we're in Iraq. But the real reason, ultimately, is an absence of will and self-determination in our own national leaders. Forget the influences on American power brokers and rulers. If we were decisive about our own destiny in our own country, on our own island and in our own nation state, we would stand up to America, we would be a significant, second tier, independent, nuclear armed power that would be widely listened to and respected both for its present strength, its past imperial glory, and its future prospects. And we would decouple ourselves from this desire to make Israel safe in the Middle East and to steal as much Arab oil as possible and also to go all around the rest of the world invading into other disputes that have nothing to do with us. We're living in a very serious time as our people delude themselves with football and Big Brother and spend all their lives working and worrying about how they're going to get their children educated and whether they're going to have a pension, we are living in a period where, in the next two years, Iran may be attacked, may even be attacked with nuclear weapons in certain scenarios. We're living in a very, very radical period. And I think dimly, more and more of our people are aware that we are between great firestorms for people who are alive now. Some of us will not see enormous changes which are happening worldwide and in our own society. But it's a very unsafe and a very unstable period. In the next 20 years, nuclear weapons will spread all across the world. And Islamist groups, amongst many others, will get those weapons. They're 60 to 70 years out of date. It's an old-fashioned technology. How to make them is on the internet. Any PhD student from a third world country who goes to the University of Sunderland and reads physics knows how to make these weapons. There's no great mystery anymore. And we have to decide as a nationality and as a people and as the peoples of these islands what our future is to be. Will we gradually split to 60% of the population when you amass and agglomerate all the other groups together? Will we split to 48%? Will we submerge ourselves into a European federal state? Will we sidle over to the Americans to such a degree that we're dragged into yet more conflicts as they gradually decline towards the middle of this century? Will we see crime increase and increase and increase? Will we see the ethnic dimension in criminality increase and become more fractured and more chaotic? The United States of America has 300 million people. They imprison 2 million. We have 60 million and imprison 80,000. And the prisons are bursting at the seams. They're bursting at the seams because 10% at the bottom of the hierarchy in this society doesn't want to work, won't work, is on benefit, 
and a significant number are criminally minded. Many of them have money for drugs though, which gets them out of their boxes and makes sure that they find a release in a society they don't otherwise like. So to begin the end of this speech, I'd like to go back to the beginning. It's the endless return, you see. It's the cycle. And talk about drugs. Now drugs are a very serious problem that affects almost every parent in this country, whether they want to admit it or not, both in the working class and the middle class, in rough areas and in bourgeois suburbs alike, because drugs are everywhere and penetrate everywhere. It's possibly the fourth biggest industry on earth. Fourth biggest industry. The biggest industries on earth, other than primary manufacturing and military services, are drugs, weapons, prostitution or the sex industry. These are some of the biggest industries on earth now. It tells you a lot about the planet that we're living on. Now, why do people take drugs? No politician who says they're liberal or libertarian or authoritarian, as John Reid professes, our President Home Secretary, on these matters, will ever answer the question, why do people take drugs? They take drugs because they're bored. Because they're bored to death by this society. Because our religion's gone. Now, if you notice, this was a uh, hundred years ago, this was a Christian society. Now, I'm not a Christian, that's why I'm wearing this. But our people once believed very firmly in this big system, and it's been a relative disaster for them, now it's collapsed, because it's left many of our people bereft. If you don't have a spiritual dimension to life, however you define it, and in whatever philosophy you want to adopt, what does the birth of a child mean? What does the death of a relative mean? What does marriage between a man and a woman? It's a man and a woman, not a man and a man, or a man and a lamppost, or a man and a conservatory, or a man and a child, but a man and a woman. What does a marriage mean if it doesn't have a spiritual dimension? This is the Muslim criticism of us, and we have to heed it if we're to revive. <coughs> because a people goes forward if it believes in higher things. The right to shop and watch Premier League football and drink beer is not enough. We have given a quarter of our country away. Enoch Powell spoke 40 years ago, and our people, and before, and our people knew he was right. And he's dead and buried now, and he's under the earth. And there was a big ceremony at Westminster Abbey when he died, and the political elite, all frightened of his legacy, gathered around, shake hands and clap and say what a great man Enoch was, a poet, a linguist, he could speak ten languages, he was made a professor of ancient Greek at the University of Sydney when he was 24. A great man. One of the traditional leaders of our country, but they were also saying privately, thank God he's dead. Because when he spoke in 1968, he was regarded as the most dangerous man in the society. And what did he say? He said that we should think about our national revival, that we should not allow large sections of the third world to come here and live, because the third world is dying and splitting. Those that remain control their own space, because their society is without a middle and just a top and a bottom. Or they perish through disease and want, or they're coming here. Because like everybody, they want a life, and they're right to. All groups are right. All groups want a face of the sun, or in the sun. All groups have a left wing, a middle and a right wing. All groups consist of people who are moderate and people who are less so. All groups have hard and soft liners. We have to choose as white people living in Europe and living in Britain and living in England and living in Berkshire, where I'm speaking to you tonight. We have to choose what we want. Do we want to go on as we are and as we have for the last 50 years? Or do we want to stand up again? Is our greatness behind us? And it's all in the history books which will be changed and attenuated and rewritten as we become a minority? Or do we want to do something? And what is this doing something that this chap's going on about? What I'm talking about is engaging in political activity which is against the grain of what's regarded as nice at the present time. Because to face what's going on now or in our culture in areas like Hansworth, as it creeps towards you where you are, is not to be pleasant. The Tories have done everything to reroute themselves and say that they're the pleasant party, not associated with harshness or negativism. But I'm afraid, in life, leadership involves confronting the dilemmas of your own society. 
If you can't face drug usage, if you can't face mass breakdown in social forms, if you can't face terrorism, if you can't stand up to America, if you can't separate yourself from European bureaucracy, you don't deserve to be in power! And you'll be swept away by other forces that will come up from beneath. And some of the people may think what's coming up from beneath is a bit fierce and a bit too strong and, you know, it's a bit, a bit too much brandy in that cake and they prefer a thinner slice. But this party stands for out of Europe as English and as British a society as possible Zero tolerance to drugs and crime. The return of the death penalty for those who need it. The return of military service for those who need it. The return of discipline and order in our social structures. The return of glory to us and our kind. And all we have to do is not go to war and not put on a military uniform and not fight as our forebears did in Belgium and France and Germany and the Low Countries and Arabia and Singapore and Burma and the Far East and Malaysia and Palestine and Cyprus and the Falklands or Iraq or Afghanistan or Korea or any place else. What our people have to do is vote and leaflet and canvas and raise money and buy a bit of merchandise, such as that over there, and attend political meetings, because there is now only one political party that stands for the reshaping of the society. There are two parties left in Britain now. One of the parties of liberal conformism and centrism, and they're called Labour in certain areas. They hardly have any presence here. They're called Liberal in other areas. Bit of a presence round here. They're called Tory, the ruling establishment in these parts of the country. But you go north of Birmingham and they hardly exist. In Manchester there's not one councillor that's got a blue rosette. Not one. There's large parts of the country where they virtually cease to exist. And there are other areas where the red ticket doesn't cover the mustard either. <coughs> but there has to be a party that is red, white and blue and that draws the two big classes in the society, the working class and the middle class together, that draws English and British people together, that has the red, which stands for a degree of social conscience, and an understanding of paternalism, and the need to look after your own people without illusions, and without squandering one's talent, or denying the differences between people, or necessarily dumbing down to the lowest common denominator, but has a responsibility which the Tories have always vacated in modernity for the people at the bottom tier who are still our people and still live on the worst estates and in the most run-down areas. This is a social party that doesn't just stand for one group and its interests within our people. And then there is the blue, which stands for social conservatism and tradition and prior dignity and patriotism, and national feeling. It's this sensibility, the blue, as part of the red, white and blue, that says it's not okay if the future leader would be of the country wants to have a few splits when he's young. It's not all right because it indicates what he's like, how wet he is, how indecisive he is, because those who take these sorts of drugs are amenable to almost anything. And they betray by doing so a certain characterlessness. If they want to be private individuals all their life, it doesn't matter. But if they want to lead a country, they've got to be cut from something greater than that. And just as you have to have red and blue, you need white between the red, the white and the blue. And it's the colour of this flag behind me. It's the colour of our country's banner and flag and emblems. It's the colour of this party. It's the colours of the British National Party for social need, right-wing and conservative discipline, and the patriotism ethnically of the people who made this island, these islands, who shaped them in their image, who are still the majority group here, and who can revive. And all they have to do in election after election is vote for this party when they see it on the ballot.
When you get a postal ballot or you go down to the station and you look at the thing and there's a range of parties and there's one called BMP, one called the British National Party, you vote for that. Whether it's local, whether it's regional, whether it's devolved, whether it's an English parliament in the future, whether it's the British parliament, whether it's the European Assembly. Each time you see that ticket, each time you see that flag, you put that cross. And if more do it in each election, and it ramps up and up and up, and we begin to get the votes that similar but different parties on the continent get, things will change. And you will not, in future, have your grandchildren as a minority in this society. It will be less crime-ridden. It will be more disciplined. It will be more ordered. It will be more patriotic. It will be a better place. I ask you to vote for, to work for, to leaflet for, to canvass for and to raise funds for the British National Party. Thank you very much.